to have you here with us. And all the distinguished guests, we are very honored to have you here. The second panel we have today is about uh, Syria, uh, specifically Kurds in Syria, uh, what Kurds call Rojava. We are going to discuss the Kurds of Syria, uh, their vision for the future, what, uh, what they hope they uh, what they for uh, for the future. But before we start, I would like to uh, inform you that there are uh, originally two guests who are not uh, here with us today. Uh, first of all, Ms. Sina Mohammed. Uh, she is the co-chair of the People's uh, Council of Western Kurdistan. She was not able to make. She is not uh, here with us. And the second guest is our Kurdish National Council. Uh, Dr. Kamaran Haji Abdo, he is supposed to have been here as well, but his uh, father passed away, so he, uh, he could not come. So I want you all to know that the, the original initial two guests are not uh, here. Uh, th three guests are with me right now. Ms. Uh, Amir Zaman, a uh, renowned journalist, uh, the economist, and currently writing for the Metal. And Mr. Saif Vedderkamp, uh, uh, the uh, North American representative of the Kurdish uh, National Congress, KMK, Russell Black Face, and uh, uh, Professor uh, Christian Sinclair, Assistant Director of the Digital Studies of the University of uh, Arizona. And we also have Mr. Alan Shamo, a member of the uh, Democratic Union Party, PYD, uh, Foreign Relations Committee, via Skype. Uh, due to the, the previous experience, we just wanted to uh, uh, start our panel with the existing guests first. Then we'll uh, join with Mr. Shamo and uh, we will continue our panel. So um, I would like to first uh, give the panel for Mr. Seth Bajaka so that uh, he can uh, tell us what's, how that's going on and what he has to offer. Okay. After 1923, there was a treaty between the Turkish state and the allies of France in the next part of Kurdistan to Syria, Eastern Kurdistan. The consecutive Syrian governments, particularly the Ba'ath Party, established a strategic plan in 1962 to assimilate by Russia, China, Venezuela, Syria, Syrian government, Iraq, Iran, Hezbollah, and Lebanon, and many other countries and states are in support of Syria. Locally, the Syrian army consists of 300,000 soldiers plus 100,000 national guards, few hundred thousand of Alawi. Sharbiha, Ba'at Farsi members, Hezbollah, police, and secret services. On the other side, the Syrian opposition consists of 80,000 fighters. Thousands of them are divided from other countries. The National Coalition of Syrian uh, Revolution and Opposition Forces consists of several groups, including the Muslim Brotherhood, uh, SNC, FSA, and uh, the Supreme Military Council. Uh, and uh, the most powerful groups are affiliated with the Qaeda, like Jabhat al Nasra, the state of Iraq, and the Shan, and other Islamic brigades. Other opposition groups calling for peaceful solution to the conflict is the National Coordination Committee for Democratic Change, which consists of 14 political parties, including the largest Kurdish party, Democratic Union Party, Fayyad. Western Kurdistan, Syria, the Kurds, Fayyadi and uh, the, Fayyad, the Democratic Union Party and the People's Defense Forces liberated Western Kurdistan in the area of the Hasekai, Kamishli, Kobani, Afri, Sheikh Maksud, Ashrafiya, and many other areas. Turkey and other states have imposed an embargo against Western Kurdistan. In addition, Turkey is building a fence on the Syrian Turkish border with links of 540 miles to separate the Kurds on both sides of the border. The insurgency has increasingly drawn jihadists from all over the world. Jabhat al Nasr and the Islamic State of Iraq and Isham, Ahrar al-Sham, Liwal Tawheed, Liwal al-Sham, the North Storm, Skor al-Sham, and other Islamic brigades become the main power for the, Syrian, uh, for the Syrian opposition with loyalty to Al-Qaeda and its uh, strategy to establish an Islamic state in Syria. Thirteen of those Islamic groups, including the FSA, issued a statement against the National Coalition, stated that these forces uh, call on military and civilian forces to unite under a clear Islamic framework based on Sharia law. 
which should be the sole source of legitimacy. Also, they stated that they do not recognize the national coalition led by Israel and uh, Prime Minister Puma. Uh, their number increased to 70 organizations, and uh, they are uh, the, uh, the, now they are in, uh, they are going in uh, struggle and fight between these groups for power is going on. In addition, Turkey is giving them support and arms in return. They attack Muslim Kurdistan and the Kurdish uh, and the People's Defense Forces. While all this uh, happened, the Syrian army gained on the ground. 115,000 Syrian fighters and civilians were killed. The American attack, uh, attack against Syria has been stopped. The United Nations passed the chemical weapon agreement against Syria without any conditions to remove the Shah al-Assad from power. Russia and the United States agreed to hold the Geneva to meeting on November 23rd. The Syrian Foreign Minister Leader Mahalim agreed to attend the Geneva to meeting without any conditions. We have big differences with the USA on Geneva 2 and the Syrian conflict. Consequently, Geneva 2 will be delayed. Kurds of Western Kurdistan struggled for freedom and democracy. The Democratic Union Party was established in 2003 as a legal organization. Hundreds of its members were arrested and many of its lead leaders executed by the Syrian Ba'ath Party. The party led a 2004 revolt, Kurdish uprising, and about 2,000 of its members were arrested. By 2011, Hayade, Democratic Union Party, has become the largest Kurdish party and is supported by the majority of the Kurds in Syria. When the Syrian uprising started, there were two different strategies established by the Kurdish parties. The Hayade, the Hayade's strategic policy is to organize and protect the Kurdish people, not take, not take sides, and to give support to the Syrian opposition who recognize the Kurdish rights and demands. Fayyade with other 13 Syrian organizations established the National Coordination Committee for Democratic Change. Fayyade established the People's Defense Unit and the People's Council of Western Kurdistan to defend and administer West Kurdistan. The Kurdish parties, a few of them joined the Syrian opposition and others did not follow any major policy or have any strategy to implement. President of Kurdistan, Mr. Masoud Barazani, at the end of 2000, had uh, 16 Kurdish parties to establish the Kurdistan National Congress. In July of 2012, President Barzani had to bring both Kurdish sides, People's Council of Western Kurdistan and the uh, Kurdistan National Council to uh, the People of the Kurdistan, uh, Kurdistan People's uh, Council together, and they established the Kurdish Supreme Council to govern and administer Western Kurdistan. On September 12th in Kamishli City, both People's Council of Western Kurdistan and KNC met and agreed to establish a local autonomy for Western Kurdistan and all 16 parties in KNC have uh, announced their support for this autonomy. Both sides established committees to, uh, will establish committees to prepare for parliamentary election in Western Kurdistan. For the law, for the year 2013, Western Kurdistan have been subjected to a brutal attack by forces belong to Jabhat al-Nasra, the Islamic State of Iraq and Shah, and many other Islamic brigades of uh, Free Syrian Army, FSA. They have used brutal methods, mass killing, torture, psychological warfare. These terrorist acts uh, are aimed. Uh, against the people of Western Kurdistan, Kurds, Arab, Assyrians, and Armenians. The People Defense Forces of more than 25,000 fighters defended Western Kurdistan and defeated the terrorist group of all of Al Nasra and uh, the ISIS and many brigades of FSA in all of the areas they attacked, like uh, Serikania, Afrin, Jandris, uh, Sheikh Maqsud, and Ashrafiya in Halabo, Kobbali, and Hasaka Rumaydan, Kamishli. On October 26, 2013, the Kurdish Defense, uh, the People's Defense Forces, 
took over the Syrian Iraqi cross border town of Tel Koja. Ali Arabiya, uh, Iraqi government welcomed the YPG, YPG uh, victory. This victory will weaken the imposed embargo by Turkey and KRG against the people of Western Kurdistan and will strengthen PYD and YKG position. Fayyad with its wise strategy and support of the Kurdish people of Western Kurdistan become a major coward player in the Syrian conflict. President of Fayyad Saleh Islam has met with Turkish officials twice, uh, uh, with uh, Iranian officials in Tehran, met with Barazani, met with the uh, Foreign Minister of uh, Russia in uh, Moscow, and uh, met with the Prime Minister of Iraq and many other groups in uh, all over the world, particularly in Europe. Uh, Mr. Saleh and the Kurdish Supreme Council, but uh, many countries, including Russia, gave their support for Mr. Saleh and the Kurdish Supreme Council to participate in Geneva to meeting as an independent opposition group. Turkey's alliance with and support of the Muslim Brotherhood and Nasra, the Islamic uh, State of Iraq and the Sham, FSA, NC, and many other groups aim to prevent the Kurdish people of Western Kurdistan from establishing an autonomous Kurdish region in Syria and to establish an Islamic State of Syria, led by the Muslim Brotherhood and the Salafi uh, radical groups. Consequently, all of the Syrian opposition are against the uh, Kurdish demands uh, and to participate in Geneva too, we can exclude the National Coordination Committee and the few democratic forces inside the FSA. I can see autonomy for West Kurdistan in the near future, recognized by regional powers, including Turkey, Iraq, and Syria, Syrian government of Bashar al-Assad, or by a new government led by the opposition. The Turkish agreement with the PKK will have a big impact on Western Kurdistan and the Kurdish nation, but all of that depends on whether Turkey will honor this agreement or not. Autonomy for West Kurdistan will strengthen the KRG position with Turkey and Iraq. It will have a big impact on Turkish policies regarding the PKK and the Kurds. Payada is a major uh, player in the Syrian conflict equation, and the United States should take this into consideration. In order to bring democratic solution to the Syrian conflict, the United States government should accept the Kurdish Supreme uh, Council to represent the Kurds at Geneva to <coughs> You cannot bring democracy to Syria without the Kurds. Thank you. Um, 
In the run-up to the uh, parliamentary elections in 2011, uh, Erdogan embraced an increasingly uh, nationalist tone. The Kurdish peace process seemed to be put, sort of put on the shelf, and it was widely assumed that uh, uh, the Prime Minister was doing this because of his presidential ambitions, that he decided to play the national card, nationalist card, get the nationalist vote behind him, and sort of uh, abandon the whole Kurdish uh, peace process. So everyone was surprised, as I said, and we all asked ourselves the question, why is this happening now? And the optimists uh, responded that Erdogan had finally seen the light, and he, decided, he realized that he really needed to solve the Kurdish problem. And so he was taking this bold step, and that uh, the, extent this, uh, the extent to which this process was successful, uh, that this would have a positive effect on Turkey's relations with the rest of our Kurds as well. And of course, there was the added bonus, perhaps, for Erdogan, of getting Kurdish support behind his ambitions to become an executive president uh, and help change the constitution, given the numbers he needed in the parliament to do this. The cynics, uh, the pessimists, argue that no, that the reason that Erdogan has decided to engage uh, Erdogan and the Kurds again was simply because he wanted to contain, Turkey wants to contain uh, the Kurds in Rojava. And this was all about getting Erdogan to use his leverage over the Kurds in Rojava to contain their nationalist aspirations. Because what had happened in the summer of 2012 was really quite dramatic from Ankara's point of view. First of all, in July, for the first time in the 28-year-old conflict between the PKK and the Turkish army, the PKK held down large swathes of territory in Shendini. Uh, most of you probably know where Shendini is, but for those of you who don't, who don't it's wedged between Iraq, Iran, and Syria. And for nearly three weeks, the PKK held down the Turkish army. And this was really a great shock. And just as that was happening, Assad's forces withdrew from the Kurdish areas along Turkey's southern border in northern Syria. And for the first time, the PKK, uh, if you'll allow me to say that the PKK, PYD, YPG are all the same family. Were running civilian populated areas. They were running towns. Uh, so here was a fledgling Kurdish state on Turkey's borders, yet another one, and run by the PKK. This, this, this was really scary for Ankara. And the word on the street, certainly among AK circles and Turkish officials I spoke to, was that Iran uh, was. Uh, encouraging this, and that indeed Qasem Soleimani had traveled to Kandil and uh, spoken to uh, the leaders there, the PKK leaders there, and offered them all kinds of support, including arms, if they uh, stepped up their war against uh, Turkey. And this was all widely assumed to be uh, in retaliation for Turkey's support for the armed opposition in Syria. So, what did Turkey decide to, decide to do? As I said, on the one hand, they, they began to engage uh, Erdogan, and so the so-called Imadur process began. Uh, and on the other hand, though, uh, they began their proxy war against the PKK, arming and uh, providing bases for not just the jihadists, because it's always, you know, people keep saying that it's only the jihadists not just the jihadists. In, initially, in fact, it was the Free Syrian Army, uh, Turkey's uh, main uh, sort of uh, clients, if you will, the groups that they support in Syria, the armed opposition, the Free Syrian Army, who were attacking uh, the YPG, PYD. But over time, of course, the jihadists sort of moved in and muscled those guys out. So that's why you now really see it as a war between the jihadists and uh, the PYD, YPG. So they were, as I said, supporting the jihadists, 
talking to Erdogan, and at the same time also trying to get Masud Barzani on board and encouraging him as well to, uh, first of all, try and prop up the PYD's rivals in Rotterdam, uh, and on the other hand, imposing this embargo that uh, others uh, mentioned today. And what is the result of this policy? <coughs> Well, I would say that it's backfiring big time. First of all, the extent to which Turkey continues to uh, support this proxy war, orchestrate this proxy war in uh, Rojava, this is weakening the hand of Kurdish leaders inside Turkey. It's undermining their legitimacy because as many Kurds see it, and certainly in Rojava, here, for my friends there, they're asking the question, how can you talk to the Turkish government when they're killing us here, as they see it, in Rotova? And so this is undermining the peace process in Turkey. No matter the reasons for why this process was reignited, the fact is that since the beginning of this year, not a single Turkish soldier, nor a single Kurdish guerrilla has died inside Turkish, Turkey's borders. And that's a very valuable thing. For the first time, Turkey is, has publicly acknowledged that it's talking to Öcalan. There has been almost no <coughs> public reaction to this. There have been no sort of widespread demonstrations, no out public outcry. Uh, the army has shut up. Not saying anything. This is terribly valuable. And this Rojava policy, this proxy war, is undermining this. I would say the same thing for the KRG. The fact of Mr. Barzani being perceived as siding with Turkey in this dispute, the fact that Mr. Muslim was not allowed to travel here, having lost his son, not being allowed to go back in through. Uh, through the KRG, even though that's where he came from, that's how he entered Rojava, this uh, violates all codes of Kurdish honor, of, uh, of, of loyalty. Uh, it's just, for me, for someone who's been uh, following the Kurds for the past 20 years, just a terrible disappointment. Uh, and. Mr. Barzani, the KRG, is one of Turkey's few <laughs> remaining friends in the region. And through this policy, Turkey is undermining its ally. Because I'm, I know that inside uh, Iraqi Kurdistan, too, uh, people are very upset by this policy. Okay, you can say that it's, um, you know, uh, well, it operates under the umbrella of the KCK, it's the cousin's sister organization of the PKK. Well, my answer to that would be so what? Um, the Turkish <laughs> government is talking to Mr. Erdogan. Uh, we have representatives of the BDP here and who will be meeting with them. State Department tomorrow. Why is Mr. Muslim any different? Well, has the PYD committed any acts of terrorism? Has the YPG committed any acts of terrorism? Has it attacked Turkey? Has it, uh, I mean, why is it stigmatized in this way? Why is the United States allowing itself, uh, to holding, allowing itself to be held hostage? to Turkey in this regard. It's not helping Turkey by doing this. Uh, this policy needs to change. The PYD is the strongest, okay, I'm sorry, I'm about to wrap it up. It, it, it's the, is the strongest, best organized opposition group inside Syria today. It represents some 10% of Syria's population. It shares Western values. It's a secular group. Uh, why on earth would you not 
want to have them on your side as your friend. And since I've been told to shut up, I will. Um, <laughs> well, all I can say is that I'm, I'm really disappointed that Mr. Muslim is not here with us today. And I would like again to extend my condolences to him. He's a man who doesn't just talk the talk, but who walks the walk. He's lost a son. He has two other sons fighting in Rojava. And uh, he, I asked him I, when I last spoke to him after he'd lost his son, but, you know, how he felt about this. And uh, he, he said that they, that they would continue their fight, not just for Kurdish rights, but for democracy in Syria. He's not talking about independence. He's not even talking about uh, federalism. Uh, he just wants you know, the Kurds' rights to be recognized for them to be allowed to run their own affairs, and they are no threat to Turkey. On the contrary, they would be very strong allies for Turkey and for the United States. Thank you. of the authority of the government. That notion of the will of the people 
somehow got lost along the way in Syria in Syria's history to a point where, as I just mentioned, it is now the needs of the state shall be the basis of the authority of the government. This then begs the question for the moment, who now forms the people upon which the authority of a future Syrian government rests? Are there legitimate interlocutors for the Kurds? The Kurds make up approximately 10% of Syria's population, and as we know, are the country's largest ethnic minority. They have long been denied the most basic expressions of, uh, of human rights, uh, expressions of identity, in a ruthless push to promote Arab nationalism and save the territorial integrity of the state. We, see, we can see comparisons in other <coughs> entities with that. A couple of questions we might then consider uh, this morning are, what does this long repressed group need to feel like equal partners in a new Syria? What mistakes of history have led us to the current situation whereby this group has been so brutally repressed? If we look at uh, concepts of citizenship, um, it might imply a quest for integration at the national level without distinction based on race, color, religion, gender, national or other origin. A new democratic Syria must, of course, ensure the process of integration moving towards democratization. It requires a willingness to integrate rather than exclude in whole or in part and it requires integration without assimilation. And that's absolutely key. Let's have a look at uh, concepts of citizenship in an earlier time. In Greek and Roman times, um, but uh, disappeared then during the medieval era, citizens initially were members of networks in emerging cities, where citizen is derived from city and those in the city, I mean those living within the walls of the city, had the power. Those city walls today are represented by an ethnic and ideological divide, leaving serious Kurds outside of those metaphorical city walls. A new constitution, a new state structure, must expand those walls in order to incorporate all of Syria's peoples, Kurds and others. It's a multinational state that for decades has been ruled by one national group, the Arabs. So really the only path to equality for a Kurd in Syria, the only way of obtaining respect and dignity, was to accept the assimilationist policies of the regime. At that point, you were allowed into the city walls. Those who refused became second-class citizens, were denied the right to express their identity and speak their language. Others became stateless altogether, simply existing as unrecognized inhabitants. Since Syria's separation from the Ottoman Empire, the country has witnessed many constitutions and constitutional changes. In the early years immediately after the dissolution of the empire, Syria was ever so briefly the Arab Kingdom of Syria under Faisal. Syria then became a mandate under the French administration. It took eight years of haggling between French mandate authorities and Syrian nationalists to come up with a constitution that was remotely agreeable to both parties. But at no point during the mandate was any constitution consistent in full force. The very first constitution, that of 1920, called the Syrian government an Arab government. So we see from the very beginning, from 90 years, plus years ago, that there was a move from the very beginning, as I said, to make Syria an Arab nation. But that was a short-lived experiment, and the French quickly established a mandate. Looking back in history, in that summer in the 20s, 1928, a Kurdish delegation petitioned the French mandate authorities in Syria at the Constituent Assembly for political, cultural, and linguistic rights, including the use of Kurdish as a medium for teaching in the Kurdish region, regions of the country. Examining the leanings towards the Kurds of the newly formed government in Ankara under Ataturk and the predominantly Kurdish, British administrated Vilayat of Mosul, the French declined to offer any concessions to Syria's Kurds. The fear was that it might encourage nationalist aspirations. In 1946, Syria eventually gained independence, and articles in the Constitution that had ensured French control of the country were duly removed from the Constitution. In 1948, another regional development affected the long-term evolution of Syria's many constitutions, and that was the creation of the State of Israel. For the first time in Syria's Constitution, 50, 
We see the addition of an article stating that Syria is a part of the Arab nation. This perhaps can be seen as a direct response to the formation of the state of Israel. At this time in Syrian history, there existed a complete lack of cohesion among the various political forces. Stability in government presupposes the development of uh, constitutional traditions. Frequent changes of regime and on other events hardly afforded an opportunity of developing the tradition of responsibility necessary for a stable government. So what was developing at that time? Well, it was really a fear of territorial disintegration, rising ethnic nationalism, worries about political stability, and regional geopolitical shifts outside of the government's control. And this, is, this is something that we've seen over time that repeats itself. Even today, we see these fears about territorial disintegration. In 1953, another constitution was declared in which we saw in Article 3 that the Syrian Republic, at that time it was not the Syrian Arab Republic, uh, should pursue a goal of a united Arab nation. But that constitution didn't last very long, and shortly thereafter, the previous 1950 constitution was reintroduced. At that same time, during the early 50s, a large-scale Kurdish political movement emerged. Some of the demands that the Kurds had at that time were constitutional recognition of the existence of the Kurdish people, Kurdish participation in administration, in an administration of the state's affairs at all levels, establishing the Kurdish language as one of the official language, languages of the country, freedom of the press, recognition of Nauru's as a national Kurdish holiday, and the establishment of administrative autonomy in the Kurdish areas. However, these demands were seen through the developing lens of this fear of territorial disintegration, the rise of Arab nationalism, and the Kurds were slowly moving up the list uh, of Syria's biggest threat. From 58 to 61, Syria was united with Egypt to form the UAR, the United Arab Republic, and it was during this time, really, that Arab nationalism exploded. The Union was an impetus to implement assimilation policies to safeguard Arab nationalism. Just one example of what happened in the Kurdish areas. Uh, Egypt sent school teachers to these areas in the Kurdish region to replace the Kurdish ones and oversee the Arabic-only language policies of the area. The Union, the UAR, lasted only three years, and immediately upon Syria's withdrawal from the UAR, the Syrian Arab Republic was declared. The Ba'ath Revolution followed in 1963. A year before that revolution, the new Syrian Arab government carried out a special census in al hattaki in the northeast of Syria, on the pretext that many non-Syrian Kurds had crossed illegally from Turkey. Kurds had approved that they had lived in Syria since at least 1945, or lose their citizenship. The government conducted that survey, that census rather, in just one day, and failed really to give the population adequate notice or information about the process. As a result, the authorities revoked the citizenship of some 120,000 Kurds, leaving them stateless and facing difficulties of all sorts, from getting jobs to obtaining state services. The number of stateless Kurds in Syria grew to nearly 300,000 because the children of stateless men are themselves considered, considered stateless. The Ba'ath Party, as uh, I said, came to power in 63, it's on the heels of the breakup of the UAR, and they continued the policy of denying Kurdish identity under the guise of promoting Arab nationalism. The temporary constitution of 1964, for example, stated the following Article 1 Syria is a part of the Arab homeland, and the people of the Syrian Arab region are a part of the Arab nation. They work and struggle to achieve the Arab nation's comprehensive unity. Article 22 stated that citizens exercise their rights and enjoy their freedoms in accordance with the law under the condition of not endangering the national security, the Arab unity, the republic's institutions, and or the goals of the popular socialist revolution. In 1969, a temporary constitution was announced which included an article stating the educational system aims at upbringing an Arab nationalist socialist generation. During that time, Kurdish identity was repressed through restricting the use of the Kurdish language in public, 
in schools and in the workplace, banning Kurdish language publications, and prohibiting Kurdish celebrations. Other non-Arab minorities, the Armenians and the Assyrians in particular, were allowed though to have private schools, clubs, and cultural associations where their respective languages were taught. In 1967, school geography texts dropped all mention of the Kurdish minority in Syria, and government registry officials began pressuring, pressuring the Kurds not to give their children Kurdish first names. The government also renamed Kurdish regions and villages to give them an Arab identity, uh, many through an administrative ordinance in 1977. Well, the current Syrian constitution, uh, which came into force in 73, theoretically guarantees certain rights and freedoms, including some protections of speech. It assigns the regulation of these various rights to subsequent supplementary laws. These laws disregard the principles of the Syrian constitution and of international human rights conventions. These supplementary laws have been used to prosecute Kurdish activists, politicians, and students. They are charged, for example, with attempting to sever a part of the Syrian territory and to annex it to a foreign state, charged with involvement in cells, seeking to weaken nationalist consensus, consciousness, sorry, and to stir up racial, sectarian strife, or involvement in unauthorized organizations. We do so for, for international and regional uh, 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 power in, in Middle East and in Syria, and that would be uh, we, we think that this establishment, this democratic and peaceful established in the Kurdish area, should be supported uh, by all the democratic uh, movements, uh, both regionally and internationally, because it is a, 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 a developing and democratic, a developing and established uh, and stability in the Middle East, and this is a very important for the Middle and Middle East and regional and international power. And this is uh, because the Kurds and the region's people, uh, Assyrian, Armenian, Assyrian, after all this one year, since uh, July 2012, the Kurds uh, administrating themselves, governing themselves, together with the, another people, as I mentioned, Caledonian, and there are Arab, there are as well, uh, uh, administrating uh, or participating in the administration that were together democratically and freely. And all this development happened in the, uh, the Rojava or the Kurdish area. Of course, it wasn't uh, uh, the, the expectation of this uh, 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 national Arab, uh, 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 yeah, militarized uh, uh, revolution, what they call it. And they started uh, bringing in or oh, allowing, fascinating the uh, al Nusra uh, jihadist salafist group uh, from uh, affiliated by Turkey, uh, spied by Turkey, and I mean supported by uh, Saudi Arabia and Qatar and all the coalition, and uh, uh, to destabilizing the Kurdish peacefully established area. This is the main aim to force the Kurdish people to move the Kurdish area and attacking them brutally. Since three months, this jihad group coming from abroad, from Afghanistan to Chile, from another country, uh, Northern Africa, this country, Algeria, Tunisia, and we all found that this one is coming in to destabilizing this uh, peaceful and democratic uh, establishment in Rojava and to establishing their uh, 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 reactionary uh, state, which they call the Islamic State of Iraq and Algeria. And this has been the Kurds uh, protecting themselves against this group, and this group is now failing to uh, this group, and therefore, this is the most important uh, thing is now after three years of this group and civil war, and we as a PYG and the Kurdish movement in the, uh, Syria, all the Kurdish, and that uh, that uh, vision that the political settlement which we appreciate it is now uh, 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 agreeing is a negotiation, is a dialogue, is a discussion that we will be delivering uh, a comprehensive, uh, uh, a comprehensive resolution on uh, participation of all the groups, all the positions uh, to decide the, the Syrian people.
son in Kansas. And this is the main issue now that occurs of a call of uh, and the ground as well, as a call of this uh, political resolution. The Kurds have to uh, represent themselves and they have a legitimate body, which is uh, Kurdish Supreme Council or High Council. They can represent their demand, their legitimate demand, and the Kurds are agreed, uh, most agreed about uh, what they are demand and what they are uh, their intention in the Syria. I mean, the Kurds, as uh, Mr. Carter Khan explained, as well, I wouldn't uh, 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 expand it a little more, that the Kurds are agreed now to have an dream resolution of uh, administration, which is integrating the uh, administration <coughs> in the United Democratic Rural Syria, and this administration is uh, agreed, uh, most of the 16 parties in uh, Rojava, political parties, and this is just uh, uh, temporarily or in training to uh, administer the Kurdish area all together with all ethnic uh, people or religious people in the area and the Kurdish government unless, uh, until the, the, the Syrian crisis get over and will be democratic. And this is the most, most important thing as uh, Zaman mentioned that, that the Kurds are more uh, democratic, pro-democratic uh, uh, sector <coughs> and uh, respecting human rights and has been oppressed for all this year. After 40, 40 years now, uh, a church in Gerich is opening after 40 years and uh, the Kurdish forces is protecting this church and uh, this is a democracy which uh, especially, I mean, we, we, we appreciate it and, uh, and emphasize on the U.S. Uh, uh, role in the European democracy and stabil stabilization in uh, the Middle East. And therefore, we as a Kurdish movement, secular movement, pro democracy movement, uh, would like to and expect it that uh, the US and uh, the Western uh, pro democracy, the one who promote the democracy, we can together and expecting the collaborating together because we are developing democracy and peace in the Middle East. Not that because this uh, 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 jihadist uh, group are really, really dangerous not only for uh, the region but for the USA and we know about it, what they did to USA and therefore we call it for all the democratic movement and we appreciate it, we are ready for to, to, to discuss and to cook work together for a peace and democracy and rural Syria where the, all the Kurds, Arab, Al Syrian, Alawi, uh, Turkmen, Armenian, all the people can represent themselves equally and freely. This is our aim and this is our intention and we needed a support from the international community to prove that we are, we can change it and we can together with you together with you for democracy and establishing in the Middle East and especially in the Kurdish area. Thank you very much. Yeah. 
security facilities that Salafis or jihadists do. And now we see they are good now. They get the control of the Turkey, they get the control of the mothers in the US, they are not listening to everybody. They would have based into Al Qaeda, which they would have had in Khalifa uh, state in the Middle East, which is not uh, just a, a risk or danger for the only Kurds was the or Turkey. If they had defeated the Kurds, they would move on to Turkey, they would move on to coming to Paris, to London, and to Washington again. And therefore, we have a, a common uh, struggle, a common uh, uh, fight to work together. And I think Turkey realized now uh, that uh, they can uh, uh, consider, uh, and I hope that Turkey and other allies of Turkey, they can consider Kurds as a uh, uh, democratic and uh, peaceful ally. Thank you. Andrew, do you have something to add? Yes, because uh, Turkey's foreign minister uh, only a day ago reiterated Turkey's policy, which is that until the PYD renounces all relations with uh, the regime, turns its back on the regime, and until it joins the Syrian National Coalition, the Turkey's policy cannot change. And so I don't see where the new white pages you describe is, frankly. The borders remain sealed. Mr. Muslim has not been invited to Turkey, as far as I know, for the continuation of the talks. And uh, why on earth should uh, the PYD do any of those things? If it were to declare a war on the regime, what would happen? They would the regime would start raining bombs on them. And would anybody help them? A hundred thousand people plus have died in Syria so far and nobody has helped the Syrian people. So why would they, you know, make an exception to the Kurds? I, I just wanted to add that. Thank you, Amir. I just wanted to you know, share with the audience that this is a delegation was told in Ankara. So I just wanted to see if uh, Mr. Shem had something to add, if he was observing any positive change. Uh, but of course, Mr. Dauto just spoke yesterday, like you say. So uh, that's great. Thanks for reminding. Now let's uh, turn to the floor. Any first of all, uh, yes. Well, I, the question if is for. You, 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 you know, you are a speaker, but the like next question is if you ever. The question please. for everyone, especially Mr. Dev, is at this stage, is to the benefit of Kurds in Rojava. Assad, if Assad stays or, or overthrown, is that to the benefit of Kurds? Do we do we profit Kurds from do Kurds profit from Assad in his power, or just we want him to go? Because Mr. Dubari said he must go. Just need to know what's your opinion. Okay, my opinion is that. Uh, the Kurds of Syria particularly pay that they have their agenda. One of it is to have a confederal autonomy <coughs> for the Kurds of Syria to administer themselves. After that, it does not matter how it comes. So the Syrian regime, if they win, because there is a possibility now that Bashar Assad could stay another 10 years or 5 years. Because uh, the United States is not going to get Bashar Assad now. And he is a strong supported by Russia, China, Iran, Hezbollah, and many other groups. So it's, uh, the Kurds, they will maneuver to get their rights. Uh, the Syrian opposition of until now, just a few of them, the National Coordination Committee, they support their Kurdish rights. And some of the FSA, Free Syrian Army groups, not many of them, but just maybe about 15 of them, they support to some extent the Kurds, but they are suppressed by the other Islamic group and they can't say anything. Everything depends on Turkey. Turkey is the key, the Turkish government. It's the key, they can tomorrow solve their problem with the PKK. Then they can kill the Egypt and the Nasr, and it's why it is a kind of strong attack. They can then give the Kurds of Syria this and this Muslim Brotherhood, which they deny everything for the Kurd, uh, deny the Kurdish rights. So Turkey is a major key. Second, the other key is the Kurdish forces.
the Kurdish forces, they are winning in the ground. They are winning. There is 20,000 fighters of Al-Qaeda belong between Jabhat al-Nasra and uh, SI, SI. They are with them. And those groups had uh, defeated them. Or we can say the People's Defense Forces defeated them in all of the areas. In any area, they are defeating them, and the biggest defeat was on the Iraqi border, crossing of San Kodja, or Yarabiya, as uh, the Arabic name for it. So it's fair uh, now, or we can say fair now, why is it different? Briefly, the regime, this is the question. Whether, how is it benefit if Assad remains or stays? Okay, I know. But, but it's that, that's how it will go. For Assad to stay or not to stay, this is a very long question. It could take many years. For us, I don't think we will benefit from Assad a lot. Now he looks nice because he is foreigner. But if he is strong again, I don't think he'll do it. Assad, if he is really want to give the court something, not just by talk, he should, uh, he can tomorrow ask his uh, parliament to pass a law to change the Syrian constitution to recognize the Kurdish right. Then we can say he is serious, or at least he wants to do that. But until now, he didn't do anything, just a law, and sometimes he attacked the Kurdish areas, yeah. particularly in Halab area, in uh, Ashrafiya, and Sheikh Mansur. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, this gentleman is. Thank you. Thank you. Syria, to take them, come take 50 50, 
they want to import the Iraqi uh, for the time of Iraq uh, experience on, on Rojava. This doesn't work. It's a different story, different time, and that's uh, what's going on. That's my answer. <coughs> Just let me remind you, Mr. Shah was on the line, so I'm going to start if there are any questions. That's the same number here. Hi, I'm Jarko from Turkish Embassy. I just have a brief, uh, two brief comments. First one, uh, with regard to the um, Turkey's uh, alleged support to the extremist forces inside Syria. I may not be surprised if these kind of allegations that were made by Mr. Badrakhan and Mr. Semba would have come from the Syrian regime itself or the supporters of the regime in the region and the uh, elements that are fighting on the side of the region because this is part of their propaganda campaign against Turkey and against the forces that are on the side of the Syrian opposition groups. Uh, and uh, the second thing with regard to this issue is that um, it's also appalling to me personally that whatever Turkey does or does not uh, is uh, regarded and considered by some of our Kurdish brothers as actions merely directed against them, such as the uh, fence issue you have mentioned uh, alongside the border of Turkey, of Turkey and Syria. I mean, while accusing Turkey on one hand for not taking enough steps to counter infiltration, uh, from its border to Syria, on one hand, and whereas on the other hand, saying that uh, the measures, the steps that are taken by Turkey to secure its borders and to uh, prevent <coughs> those kinds of infiltration against this extremist threat, I think it's uh, contradictory. Uh, and uh, I don't uh, want to explain, yeah, I'll be very short, I'll be very short. Uh, I will not respond to each and every allegation. But I will always say that Turkey Syria takes the steps against extremist threats uh, inside Syria, but Turkey is not the one uh, who should be blamed because of uh, the rise of extremism in Syria. It's to protract this conflict and a prolonged civil war in Syria that poses it. And the last point, with regard to the PYD's role, um, Mr. Mann said that um, the reason why the United States might not be engaging with PYD is because of Turkey's policy. Well, I mean, since Mr. Badrakhan also mentioned that Turkish officials uh, met with PYD <coughs> officials, uh, I think that's not a valid point for that reason. And uh, the reason uh, why PYD uh, might not be taken, of course, I cannot speak on behalf of the US authorities, they are themselves with responsibility to kind of allegations, but uh, two issues. First one, uh, how much the PYD is representative of the old Syrian Kurds inside Syria? First thing, and whether uh, the PYD uh, right now uh, in a position to clearly, but uh, very clearly and openly identify its stance against the Syrian issue. Thanks, I'm going to respond. Uh, yes, actually, um, you spoke of allegations. Uh, I'm a journalist and I traveled to the Syrian Turkish border and I've done quite a few, a lot of reporting there. And I must have spoken to hundreds of liars in that case. <laughs> Many of the wounded Syrian fighters I spoke to who were being treated in Turkish state hospitals, having been transported by ambulances uh, provided by the Turkish state, uh, freely admitted that they were fighting uh, the PYD, YPG, inside Syria, and the Turkey was helping them and providing them with arms. So, um, you know, just wanted to let you know. Okay, uh, I also <laughs> like uh, Mr. Shemo to respond. Uh, Mr. Shemo, the question is uh, how PYD represents the Kurds in Syria? This is the first question. And the second uh, question is, what is your clearly, can you clearly define your stance uh, towards the Assad regime? Is that correct? <coughs> the Assad regime, what would you like to say? The Mujahams, uh, or uh, I don't think you're able to give it to you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, thanks. Thanks for, thanks for all the questions. 
Uh, yeah, very interesting. Uh, that PYD is uh, uh, one of uh, yeah 22 parties now in uh, Syria. Uh, they are representing their own uh, percentage of the people, and we uh, consider that the legitimate representation of the Kurds in Syria is that the Supreme Kurdish Council, which is consisting of both councils, People's Council of Western Kurdistan and the uh, Syrian National uh, Council. So it is 50-50% uh, both councils are representing <laughs> in this uh, representing body. This representing body has been elected and promoted by the Kurdistan people and have been uh, uh, recognized <coughs> and supported by the old Kurds, most old Kurds in Syria. Therefore, we think that the Kurdish Supreme Council is legitimate uh, elected representative of the Kurds. The PYD is one of these 22 parties which is consisting of two councils, which council is 30-50%. And that, therefore, we think is elected and is not about the PYD, how much, how much percent we are presenting. And that uh, it, it will be a transparent election Transparent referendum in future, and the results will show how much PYD will uh, gain or win the votes. Uh, this we speculate on. <laughs> the second question the stand is clear from the very start. On um, uh, uh, 30 of May, uh, we had a PYD and uh, the democratic movement for democratic change uh, in Syria declared clearly this is a dictator regime should go and with all this but should go with on the, uh, the forces and the, the, the movement of the Syrian people. Syrian people can make this regime to go peacefully and democratically by their own. And if they need it uh, to protect themselves, they can. But they cannot just uh, proxy uh, or uh, fighting on behalf of uh, Saudi Arabia, Qatar, Turkey, or whoever won the Islamic State. This is a clear, it was a clear position one month after the, the, the peacefully and democratically uprising in Syria. It was clear, and this is the excuse, as my another colleague uh, speaker mentioned, that that the Turkish uh, uh, sorry, uh, foreign minister said that, that we should take stand. We are stand, we are against this right, brutal dictator regime and we are not supporting this jihadist that Islamic establishing Islamic in state in Syria. We want a democratic, we are not neutral, we are against both this. We are standing for a democracy and peace and stability in Syria. And for democratic rule, everyone, every Syrian can express themselves, free, represent themselves free, freely and democratically. Thank you. 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 Based in uh, Damascus. The second question is uh, what's your view on the Geneva 2 conference? And the third one is as far as we know, there are still uh, Assad regime changes <coughs> in some of the northern Syria, including Kamishla, I believe. Is there any way you can give us update? Thank you. I'm very happy to this question. The last the first question is as PYD, are you still a member of the National Coordination Party? This is the first question. And the second question, what is your take on Geneva 2 conference? And the third one is, uh, as much as I know there are some regime presence, regime troops in some parts of Russia, what is the uh, situation right now? Are they still there? Right. Uh, regarding the, the, the coordination body uh, for democratic change, we, we, we are the founder uh, of this uh, democratic change. Syria. It's a strategic ally to us. It's very important because we live in Syria, we don't live in Syria. We have to work for democratic change 
and this is the organization, the civil organization, <coughs> that are uh, uh, moving in the, Muslim, in the ground, and they are not relying on the regional and international uh, global uh, power to change that. I on their own forces, their own people, the ones that are democratic and peaceful change in Syria, they are against this regime, and therefore we, they are our strategic allies in Syria for native democratic Syria. Therefore we have to work with them, and we wish that all that opposition uh, was underground democratic, and that first of all, they are recognizing the ethnic minorities, not only the Kurds, the Assyrian, the Czechs, the Armenian, and the Druze, and the Alawites as well. They, all of them, they are ethnic, all of them have a different background, and therefore they are a democratic uh, establishment, as a democratic movement, we should support it, and this will be a model for all the students in the future. Uh, regarding Geneva, yeah, Geneva means uh, the Kurds have been supporting this one, and the most, the most interesting thing that the Kofi Annan and the Geneva, the first Kofi Annan Geneva resolution was uh, based on uh, the four uh, points was suggested, six plan points was uh, uh, suggested by uh, the democratic movement and the PYD. The four of them, the Kofi Annan plan, was suggested by the PYD and the coordination body uh, for democratic change in Syria. And that we supported this, and we wanted to be a comprehensive, uh, uh, equal representative, and a comprehensive, by meaning comprehensive, including every group, every opposition, to what they consider themselves opposition. But they have to represent the people, that they have to represent uh, the on the ground people. Yeah, this is the most comprehensive. And the second point we uh, decided to uh, uh, support the development of the Geneva Group is uh, let Syrian people, let the Syrian opposition, let the Syrian ethnic minorities deciding to determine their their fate. Yeah, if they needed your support, the international support support, you will come to support and advice. But let us decide. Let the Syrian people decide. Let the Armenian people let the Geneva people who live in Syria decide their fate. And if they need it, Europe, they will ask Europe, and it's your duty to support their demand, not deciding for that, not the Western and the regional powers. Uh, sorry, the sector. The